How's it going everyone? Hope you're well. Mr. Boulder back and I'm back tonight with a question and answer video. I've not done one of these before, so I'm looking forward to this. Um, I put a poll up on YouTube and asked people if they'd be interested in seeing this kind of video and for the most part people wanted to see it, so here we are. So I've got 20 questions to go through that I received. I actually received 21, but uh, a couple of people asked pretty much the exact same thing, so I'm just going to put those two together. So let's get cracking after the usual sip of coffee. Here we go, in my Belinda Carlisle mug. Yep, I'm that much of a fan that when I saw the other week I bought a mug as well. So first up is a question from Metal Marty Mac. And he asked me, um, how many Irish um, metal bands do you list, have you got in your collection? Um, to be honest, only three. So uh, first one, not really a metal band, um, a hard rock band. Um, and everyone knows this band, a huge, huge band. Uh, Thin Lizzy, and this is their Armed and Dangerous album. For the most part, I don't really care for live albums, but um, this one's essential, I think, along with like Iron Maiden's Live After Death and uh, ACDC's um, Live at Donington 1991. Um, everyone knows these guys, of course. Uh, there's loads of classic stuff on this. Obviously, the boys are back in town, but other great stuff like Cowboy Song, Dance in the Moonlight, one of my favourite Thin Lizzy songs. Uh, Jailbreak, stuff like that. The Rocker, excellent track. Thin Lizzy, Hard Rock from Ireland. Also from Ireland is uh, Therapy, and this is their Trouble Gum album from 1994, which I absolutely love. Listen to it so much back in the day when it came out. Um, an album that's 10 out of 10, packed full of bangers. Stuff like Nowhere, Die Laughing, Trigger Inside, The Knives. Um, brilliant, brilliant stuff on this album. So that's another band from Ireland. Excellent stuff from them. And the only other band from Ireland that I listened to is Gamma Bomb, uh, the Irish Thrashers, and this is their Speed Between the Lines album, their excellent Speed Between the Lines album. Um, great stuff on this, like Kurt Russell, World Gone to Hell, um, Bring Out the Monster, 6616. Great uh, great band, uh, great thrash from Ireland. So that's my answer to question one. These were the bands in my collection I listened to from Ireland. Question two come from Metal Mickey, and it was... Um, what would you rather do? Uh, either go on stage and jam Am I Evil with the Big Four or spend the day in the studio with Iron Maiden while they record their new album? Now, as excellent as it would be to uh, go up on stage and jam Am I Evil with Anthrax, Slayer, Megadeth and Metallica, I'd have to go with the Iron Maiden choice. Um, no doubt about it. Uh, just to spend a day in the studio with those amazing musicians who have created so much legendary music over the years. It's something I just couldn't pass um, by, you know. To see those guys up close and personal, um, doing what they do best, making amazing music, seeing how the album comes together in the studio. All those fantastic musicians and minds that just have to take in all that knowledge. So that would definitely be an answer to that question. Being in the studio uh, with Maiden for a day is something I just could not pass up at all. Um, you know, it'd just be such a massive opportunity. And obviously it would last all day, whereas the whole jamming the Am I Evil would only be, be sort of a five, ten minute thing. So I'm definitely going to go with Iron Maiden on that. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Question three is from Grant at G-Rock. And he just says, um, how do you store your collection and how did you get into collecting music? Um, I store my collection. You can probably see just down here. Um, I've got a load of albums down there. and I've got some others in front of that as well because they're obviously for space. As much as I love my records, I take up a hell of a lot of room. And um, all my CDs and cassettes are in a room upstairs um, in the, my office. Um, I've got all my CDs up there. Um, also, my small bunch of collection of tapes are up there as well. So that's where that's all stored. And I've got some uh, in front of me over here as well, um, near the uh, my record player. Um, and how did I get into collecting music? Just um, I, I just love music, basically. And uh, once I got the bug and started picking stuff up, I started to pick up left, right and centre. So that's my answer to Grant's question. Uh, question four is from a very good friend of mine um, that I met back in uh, the late 90s. We quickly bonded over a love of bands like uh, Bon Jovi, Motley Crue, Poison. And this friend of mine, actually, uh, he really got me um, introduced to bands like um, Rat and Dokken, who I weren't really that familiar with before. Uh, my friend Stuart, um, he asked a question and it is, um, how did I build my collection? Did I always collect or did I have a break? in general and um 
yeah, basically sort of how I sort of built my collection up, really. Well, it all started back in 1992. That's when I really got into collecting music. Um, and buying music, I should say. Um, I was a teenager back then. And uh, I would help my mum and dad around the house with things like, you know, walking the dog, feeding the dog, that kind of thing to sort of get my pocket money, to earn my pocket money. And then all my pocket money was spent on uh, going into town on Saturday and uh, buying music. You know, because back in 1992, of course, there was no internet. So uh, if you wanted music, you had to actually get on the bus and go into town and buy the music with your hard-earned money. Um, so I did buy a lot of stuff um, back in 92, 93. All my money would be spent on buying um, seven-inch singles, twelve-inch singles. Every now and then, I get an album, but it was mostly singles. And I've decided to get a couple of those out to show you. These have been in my collection for like well over thirty years. Um, and I've just kind of carried on sort of uh, collecting ever since then. Really, um, I did have some periods where I didn't collect as much. Um, Back in about 2000, um, 2005 actually, not 2000, I actually really got back into buying records. I stopped buying records around 96, I started to buy CDs. Uh, but back sort of 2005, I definitely got back into buying um, music uh, records, definitely. And I bought a hell of a lot over the last few years. Um, so that's how I've sort of built my collection, really. It's been, for the most part, buying a lot of the time. There was a bit of, there was a couple of times where I didn't buy as much, but... Um, for the most part, um, bought a lot, but I've definitely been buying a hell of a lot in the last sort of five, ten years, no doubt about it. So I'm going to show a couple of the things I've had in my collection for over 30 years. These are a couple of 12-inch singles. Up first, I'm going to show this. This is Pantera and their Walk single, which I got back in 1992. And I played this over and over again. And uh, this is an absolutely amazing sounding record as well. Whenever I put it on... It's much louder than a lot of the other records that I've got. I just played this to death. It's got Walk on it and No Good Attack the Radical. And on side two, there's live versions of Cowboys from Hell and Psycho Holiday. I played this so much, it was ridiculous. There's the record. Uh, massive song. Excellent stuff from these guys. Um, just huge. Absolutely huge for me back in the day. No doubt about it. And of course, because I'm trying to sleeve on a camera, it's been a sod to get back in, but it's gone back in quite easy in the end, actually. So that's Pantera's Walk. I've had since 1992. And uh, something else I've had since 1992. And here's Iron Maiden's uh, Be Quick or Be Dead single on 12-inch picture disc. Let's take this out of the sleeve for you. I can't believe I've had these records for over 30 years. There we go. Nice-looking picture disc. The guy's on the back. So yeah, for the most part, I've pretty much collected the whole time in the last sort of 31 years. Um, a couple of sort of breaks where I didn't buy it as much. But um, for the most part, I'm always kind of buying and um, just love it. Absolutely love it, of course. So thanks, Stuart, for your question, mate. That's excellent. Cheers, man. Up next, it was a question from uh, someone called Schillinger. And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, so I apologise if I got that wrong, man. Um, five most prized records in your collection. I was actually with uh, the, my mate who was just talking about Stuart when I got these. I uh, got these in Norwich on a, um, a trip to Andy's Records back in about 2000. And um, the reason I'm showing these is because this was a case of uh, right place, right time. I actually did a, um, a video about this um, haul that I picked up a while back. And I've got to show these five because I was so, so lucky to grab these. These are very, very hard to come by and they're bloody expensive if you haven't got them. Definite case of right place, right time. Up first, I'm going to show Warren, and this is Cherry Pie from 1990. All these records I picked up were brand new, just sitting there. They cost about eight or nine quid. You are definitely not getting these for eight or nine quid now. Uh, very, very hard to come by. This one's not as hard to come by, but the rest I'm going to show really are. Um, up next is uh, Lynch Mob, and this is Wicked Sensation. Lynch Mob, of course, featuring George Lynch and Mick Brown, formerly of Dokken. Superb album, this. Uh, so many good songs on this. Sweet Sister Mercy, title track, uh, River of Love, All I Want. Uh, Dance of the Dogs, For a Million Years, Street Fighting Man. Very hard to come by. Excellent, excellent hard rock. And uh, again, Lynch Mob, the self titled from 1992. This is another fantastic slice of excellent old school hard rock. 
Uh, these salves are so hard to find. I was so lucky. Uh, Jungler Love, Tangled in the Web, no good. Cold is the Heart, Cover of Queen's Tie Your Mother Down. I Want It When Darkness Calls. So, so grateful to have these albums. It has to be said. Up next is Rat and Detonator from 1990. A very underrated Rat album. There's so much good stuff on this. There's only one track that's a bit of a bit weak, but the rest of it's excellent. Uh, Favourites on this is... Um, Loving You's a Dirty Job, One Step Away, um, Can't Wait on Love, Giving Yourself Away, Top Secret, Not Easy to Come By At All, excellent album from those guys. And the last one I'm going to show is Vince Neil's Exposed from 1993. Uh, yeah, this cost me about £8.50 and this uh, goes for way more than that these days. Again, very, very lucky to have this, without a doubt. The top five uh, prized sort of um, pieces in my collection, no doubt about it. Albums that are not easy to come by and cost an absolute fortune if you do see them out and about in the world these days. So there you go, mate. That's, thank, there's your answer to your question. Thanks for that. Up next was the the, the question I'm going to put together because two people, um, Robert Morris and someone called The Director, asked pretty much the exact same thing. And that is... Um, What's my opinion on prog rock and prog metal? And uh, I think it was the director said uh, mentioned Opeth and Dream Theater. Um, as far as prog metal and prog rock goes, I'm a fan. I'm not a massive fan, though. It's not a style that I listen to loads and loads. Um, I mean, I do have a couple of albums by Pink Floyd. I've got Best Of by Rush. Not Sorry, not Rush. Um, yes. Uh, Roundabout is my favorite song on that. That's an excellent prog track. And as far as bands like Opeth and Dream Theater go, I've only got one Opeth album and I need to listen to it more, Blackwater Park. It's a good album though. I've got about two or three Dream Theater albums um, and they're really, really good. That's um, uh, Awake from 1994 and Images and Words from 1992. I've got a change for all seasons as well. Uh, the thing I like about prog when I'm in the mood for it is just the fantastic uh, musicianship from all those involved and the complex um, song structures like, you know, throwing different kind of timings and that. So I am a fan of prog rock and prog metal, but I don't listen to it loads and loads. But uh, yeah, sometimes when I want something that's a bit of a challenge to listen to, I'll definitely listen to some prog stuff. So thank you both for your question. That was excellent. Uh, right, now, number seven is from uh, Dylan, Death Metal D, 1976. How did they get into rock and metal and first gig and festival? Um, how I got into it, basically, was my dad. When I was younger, he played uh, a lot of a lot of albums, um, especially from three certain artists. So back in the day when I was young in the 80s, after me and my brother had finished watching stuff on TV like um, The Incredible Hulk, uh, The A-Team, Knight Rider, Dukes of Hazard, uh, TJ Hooker, stuff like that. TV would go off and my mum and dad would play music. And the ones that my dad played the most uh, that really stuck with me were Led Zeppelin, Bad Company and uh, Jimi Hendrix. And that's where it all come from, to be honest. Uh, my dad played those loads. I know... Those early Zeppelin albums, like the back of my hand. I know every single note, every single lyric. Uh, Hendrix as well. And uh, Bad Company, which is, of course, the band that uh, came um, from free breaking up after Paul Kossoff died. So that's how we got started. My dad started playing that stuff. And, uh, yeah, it just stuck with me. It made such a massive impression on me. So my first gig, um, that was in June 1993, the 5th of June. I looked this up today. There was a Milton Keynes Bowl, and it was Metallica, and uh, that was still on the Black Album Tour in 1993. And the rest of the lineup was um, Megadeth, which was quite a big deal at the time, because it was the first time they'd ever played together in 10 years. Um, the Almighty and Diamond Head. Now, that is an amazing first gig. The thing that sticks out in my, my memory most about that day is it was absolutely roasting hot. Um, Diamond Head played first, and they were good. Um, Although Sean Harris did come out wearing a really cheesy looking uh, Grim Reaper cost costume, which was stupid back then um, and still stupid now. Up next was the Almighty, who were excellent. Um, I'd only just recently got into them. I bought some of their singles from the Power Tripping album, like Addiction, uh, Out of Season, stuff like that. They were really, really good. Megadeth were on next. I was so excited for Megadeth because I was a big fan. They were really good live. Um, if I'm completely honest, you know, Dave Mustaine's vocals sometimes can be a bit whiny. I do remember him being whiny that day. Although they were still really good. I still really enjoyed them. Um, apart from one prick behind me shouting for the Almighty throughout the entire set, which kind of spoiled it a little bit. 
And then Metallica came on and played for about two and a half hours and just played all the good stuff. All the stuff that was big at the time, like the singles from the Black Album, and played stuff like Disposable Heroes and Master of Puppets, which is probably one of my favourite, well, it is one of my favourite Metallica songs. Stuff from Ride the Lightning, Justice, Kill Em All. It was absolutely superb, like two and a half hours, brilliant, brilliant stuff, an absolutely amazing first gig. Uh, fantastic memories was there with my friend Glenn. And my friend Glenn was also with me when we went to off my first festival, which was Donington 1995. Let's have a quick look at my notes. The, um, the lineup for that was Metallica, Therapy, Skid Row, Machine Head, Slash Snake Pit, Slayer, White Zombie, Warrior Soul, and Corrosion Conformity. That was on August the 26th, 1995. Um, fantastic day. Um, Skid Row, I can't remember if I said them, they played. What sticks out in my memory about that is um, I wasn't even a fan at the time. So I actually saw them with Sebastian, and I don't really remember anything about it, which uh, still pisses me off to this day. Uh, the other thing that sticks out in my mind about that day is that while we were there, we bumped into one of my um, my friend Glenn. He bumped into one of his friends, and he hung out with us for the rest of the day. And we got chatting to these Russian people who sneaked a load of vodka into the festival. And this guy uh, proceeded to drink loads of the vodka that the Russians brought in. Got absolutely plastered, and we had to carry him up to the first aid tent, literally dragging his feet along the floor because he got so pissed. Um, passed out, and I think he woke up at about four o'clock in the morning in Nottingham Hospital. Uh, I found out from my friend uh, afterwards, so he missed the majority of the day. But a fantastic first festival, that was brilliant. Um, I remember Crozier could fool me were good. Warriors Soul were fantastic. They should have been a bigger band. Uh, White Zombie were good. Slayer were, of course, excellent. Slash's Snake Pit was really good. I remember they had James Lomenzo, currently in Megadeth on bass, and Brian Tishi uh, of uh, sort of Dead Daisies. I think he's been in Journey as well. Pride and Glory. Yeah, he was on the drums. They were really, really good. Um, Machine Head were fantastic. No Chris Contos on the drums, I remember, but that was the first album. They were really killing it back then. Excellent stuff. Um, Therapy, great. Excellent hard rock. Uh, alternative rock, I should say. And uh, Metallica were, of course, fantastic. So that was a brilliant day. So that's the answer to that question. Uh, number eight is from DJ Knight 17 and it was how much do you music do you listen to in a day? Um, sometimes loads and sometimes not at all. Uh, if you watch my entry video to Josh Keach's 200 subscribers videos, I talked there about my own other, other real interest is uh, true crime. I'm massive into true crime. I watch loads of true crime documentaries. And uh, I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. Um, so a couple of days a week, a lot of my podcasts drop on the same day, Mondays and Wednesdays. So I pretty much listen to true crime podcasts all day while I'm at work. Uh, so I don't really tend to listen to a lot of albums, or a lot of music, I should say. And other days, I can listen to about seven or eight albums. And and sometimes I'll just listen to a Spotify playlist if I don't fancy listen to any albums. I just want to listen to a load of different stuff all on the same playlist. So that's your answer to that question. Uh, sometimes not a lot at all, and sometimes I listen to loads and loads of music. So cheers for that. Number nine is from Lestat1979. And it asks, um, brief history of your life, uh, past jobs, etc. What I do for work now. Um, I was born in Islington in London uh, back in the 70s. Uh, and we lived in Wood Green to, up until 1985. And then we left London uh, to go and live in a town called Bedford, which I lived in for about 30 years. And um, about seven or eight years ago, I moved to um, Luton. Um, so that's a brief part of uh, my uh, sort of history. As far as jobs goes, I'm self-employed. I work for myself. Um, I'm a window cleaner, so of course this time of year in uh, the UK is not a good time to be working outside because it's bloody freezing cold. Uh, I did some other jobs back in the 90s, but I've been self-employed uh, since the late 90s. So, so that's sort of brief history of my life, really, uh, for where I was born and all that kind of thing and what I do for work. Um, so thanks for that. Up next, question 10. This is from Keenan Kustara. I apologise if I butchered the pronunciation of your name there, mate. Uh, me and Keenan talk a fair bit on Instagram. I think he's from uh, Holland. And he asks, um, what was the first record that I ever bought? Let's try that now. Now, this isn't the same one because I, um, I, I lost the original one. I think I lent it to someone, never got it back. And I'm gutted because uh, it was an original 1990 press. So probably quite get quite a nice little bit of money for it today but the first album i ever bought on lp was pantera's cowboys from hell 
Excellent album. Uh, no bad songs. This apart from um, track two, Primal Concrete Sledge. Not really fussed on that, but an absolute banger. This one. Uh, title track superb. Cycle Holiday Domination. One of the best breakdowns ever. Maybe the first breakdown. Shattered Clash Reality. Message in Blood. The Sleep. Art Shredding. That was the first album I ever bought back in 1993. Wish I still had that bloody original press now. I've got no idea where it is. But that's the answer to that question. So thanks, Keenan. Question 11. Trevor Hickey. Uh, would I join Trevor and uh, Josh Keach and the others for a stream sometime? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, of course I would. Uh, the only problem is Josh a lot of time does his um, live streams on Saturday nights. And I'm often out on Saturday nights. Uh, whether I'm playing a gig or I'm uh, out sort of watching a gig, you know, by big bands or by local bands. So that's the only reason I haven't jumped on uh, one of Josh's streams. But I definitely would. So that's uh, the answer to that question, Trevor. Question 12 comes from The Rock Beast, Archie. And he asks, um, how many Kiss albums do I own and which ones have I listened to the most? Um, I own everything up until Hot in the Shade. I think I've got about 20 studio albums. I've got about 15 of them, I think. Uh, some of them I only listen to once or twice. And not because I don't like them. I've just got such a massive collection. You know, it's hard to sort of uh, know what to listen to. But the ones I've listened to the most is definitely uh, Destroyer and Love Gun. Those two albums are superb. And the other ones I've listened to the most are 1983's Lick It Up, and 1987's uh, Crazy Nights. So that's the answer to that question. Cheers, Archie. Thanks for sending it in. Question 13 comes from Matt Carter. Um, Am I a fan of Fear Factory? And um, which is my favourite album? Uh, Matt says that he's a fan of Fear Factory since 93. I got into Fear Factory back in 95 um, when the manufacturer was absolutely everywhere. So yes, the answer to your question is I am a fan of Fear Factory. Superb band. I've got all their albums. Um, I think they've lost a bit of traction over the years. Um, but they've actually put out some really, really good albums um, in the last sort of 10, 15 years. Like The Industrialist is a fantastic album. Uh, Genexus is really good as well. Uh, their last album was pretty good. Uh, definitely not their best though, but um, yeah, a big fan. Uh, been a fan for like I've got about twenty seven years now, something crazy like that. So that's the answer to your question, Matt. Yes, definitely into Fear Factory. Um, I've got a Fear Factory record to show in my next week's uh, collection upload video, actually. So stay tuned for that. So cheers. Number fourteen is from Joe Hanley. And he says, uh, at some point, will I be doing the Judas Priest and Black Sabbath album ranking? Yes, I'll be doing both of those this year. Um, I, I'm missing a couple of Black Sabbath albums. Cross Purposes I'm missing. And I think there might be another one. So I'd need to pick those up. And as far as Judas Priest goes, I've got everything apart from the first album, Rock and Roller. So I need to pick that up before I do my ranking. But those will definitely be coming to the channel this year. I've um, got Twisted Sister album ranking coming soon, and Zentrix, actually. So keep your eyes peeled for that. So thanks for your question. Uh, number 15 is from Simon Pieface, and he simply asks, uh, do you think Everton will get relegated this season? Uh, so if you're outside the UK, Everton is a football club, and uh, we're in the shit, basically, uh, right down in the relegation zone. So, uh, obviously, I'm hoping we're not going to get relegated, Simon, but it's not looking good at the moment. Should have sacked Frank Lampard earlier, as far as I'm concerned. So, that's the answer to your question. Cheers, Simon. Uh, question 16 comes from Keith Wood. And Keith asks, what's the most overrated release of recent times, and which album do you think is underrated? Uh, I'm going to sort of talk about two albums here. Um, I remember when Machine Head put out uh, things called Onto the Locust, I remember everywhere I was looking in magazines, so like Metal Hammer and that, were absolutely raving about this album, saying it was absolutely superb, really, really good. Best album of their career. Um, and I was out with my mate Glenn, and he actually bought this album. And I remember we were listening to it in the car on the way back from Norwich, and I was just thinking to myself, what's the big deal about? I'm just not getting it at all. It had a couple of good songs, had some nice riffs on it, but on the whole, um, considering like everyone was talking about this album being an absolute beast, I was just like, I don't get it. I just don't see what's that great about it. And then when it finished, I just thought, completely overhyped. And the other one I'll mention is, uh, again, my friend Glenn had it, Slipknot's The Grey Chapter. Again, people raving about it like it was the best thing since sliced bread. Heard it, and it was just completely average to me. I uh, just didn't think it was very good at all, and um, never picked it up. 
as far as Slipknot goes, I've got the first two and I've got all hope is gone. That's all I need from Slipknot. Uh, they put out some very overrated stuff in my eyes, but still a great band, no doubt about it. Um, and then the album that I think is underrated. Let's show this now. This is the most recent album from uh, UK death metalers, Cancer. This is Shadow Group, which I think they put out in 2018. Yep, 2018. Yeah, this one's flown on the radar, I think. It's a really, really strong album. I mean, it's not an absolute classic by any stretch of imagination, but I think it's really good. And um, you don't see people show it very often. I remember I've seen Metal Marty Max show this. But this is a really strong return from these UK death metal legends. Great songs on this, like Garot, Ball Cutter, Organ Snatcher, um, Half Man, Half Beast, Crime So Vile. There's some quite laughable lyrics on this, if I'm going to be completely honest. But... Um, on the whole, it's now. I still really enjoy it. And it's completely flowed under the radar. And um, I think it definitely deserves more love. So that's the album that I think is underrated from recent times. Uh, question 17 is from Thomas at Merciful Metal. And he said, uh, if you could hear one album again for the first time, what would it be and why? Um, I don't even have to think about this. This is Nile, uh, American tech, uh, Technical Death Metalers, and this is their Annihilation of the Wicked album, which came out in 2005. The reason I choose this is because I remember um, in the town I used to live in Bedford, there was a music shop called MVC, and I remember I went in there one Saturday, and uh, I'd never heard of Nile before, and the CD was sitting in the rack, and the hype sticker on it said, this is for fans of Suffocation, Morbid Angel, and Cannibal Corpse. I thought, right, that's me. So I picked up a complete blind buy, Listen to it, and it absolutely blew me away. Um, it's just a phenomenal record. When it comes to listening to albums in the car, I usually have something in the car. I listen to it about two or three times, and then I'll swap it out for something else. This was in my CD player in my car for about 10 days straight, I think. Um, so why do I choose this one? Because it just blew me away. It's just an absolutely fantastic slice of technical death metal. Everything about it is superb. The guitar riffing is absolutely amazing. The solos are great. George Colas' drum is fantastic. Um, quite progressive, really. Some of the songs on this are really long. Um, some nice time signature changes. Um, that was Tola Wade and Carl Sanders' uh, trading vocals. Re sound really, really fantastic. Um, and just fantastic songs. Stuff on this like Sacrifice Unto Seebeck, uh, Cast Down the Heretic, Lash to the Slave Stick, the title track. Just completely blew me away. And I would definitely go back and listen to like to listen to this like I, when I heard it for the first time. It just floored me. It made such a massive impact on me. And I just absolutely love this band. And this album is absolutely superb. If you're into death metal and you've not heard this, I can't recommend enough that you go and check it out. It is an absolutely fantastic slice of technical death metal. Like I say, quite progressive in places. Great vocals, great riffs, great drums. Everything about it is superb. If you haven't heard this in just your heavy stuff, I can't recommend enough you check it out. That is definitely an absolute beast of an album. Question 18 comes from Colin B. and uh, Most proud of items in your collection. So this is kind of stuff that might have a bit of um special place in your heart kind of stuff. Or it's just stuff, kind of some decent memorabilia that, um, that you've got. I haven't got a lot I have to say, but I'll show these bits. First up is this Best of Kiss CD. Now that's not what the sort of big deal is. But inside here, I've got a bit of paper with Gene Simmons' name on it. Uh, sorry, signature. So it says, to James from Gene Simmons. What happened was, uh, Gene was um, over here in the UK at the time, filming a TV show, reality TV show, about putting a band together of school kids. And it was over in Lowestoft, where I've got some friends and family. And someone that, um, that my friends know knew someone who was working at school, so got Gene's signature for me. So that's a pretty cool thing to have in the collection. Um, up next is something that I've only had a few months, actually. This is John Karabi's book. John Karabi, formerly of The Scream, former Motley Crew, and just basically all-around excellent singer-songwriter. Went to see him back in December in Milton Keynes doing a, an acoustic gig. So I bought his book, and there it is signed for me. So that's a pretty cool piece to have in the collection. Really happy to have that. Still need to read it, actually. I tend to read more in the summer when uh, you can sit out in the garden here in the UK. Um, and the other three things I'm going to show is just basically some more records of my collection that I feel very, very lucky to have because they're not easy to come by at all. Um, up first is a band I've talked about already on this video. This is Kiss, uh, an original press of Destroyer. 
And the reason that I hold this dear to me is it's a quite a rare red vinyl pressing. Um, absolutely fantastic album. One of their best as far as I'm concerned. Of the ones I've listened to the most. Like I said, I need to listen to other stuff more. But um, that's a great album. So I feel very lucky to have that in my collection. So I definitely hold that quite dear to me. Um, yeah, great stuff from them. And then I'm going to show another couple of uh, rare records that I've got in my collection. Again, it was a case of right place, right time. Here's an original press from 1994 of Machine Heads Burn My Eyes. In my opinion, the only Machine Head album you really need. Oh, this is another band I find incredibly overrated. But they are absolutely knocked out of the park with this album. Uh, Davidian, massive song, obviously. Old, A Thousand Lives, None But My Own. Um, Death Church, A Nation of Fire, Blood for Blood. No bad songs on this album. It's a 10 out of 10, no doubt about it. So that's another piece of my collection that I'm really happy to have. And the last one that I'll show is a band that also I've talked about so far in this video. And this is an original press of Fear Factory's D Manufacture from 1995. Absolutely huge album for me in 1995. These guys completely blew me away. Just an absolutely fantastic album. To get an original press from an album from 95 is not easy. But stuff on this, like the title track, Self Bias Resistor, Zero Signals, phenomenal stuff. Replica, Body Hammer, Piss Christ, Therapy for Pain, excellent stuff. So that's that. So thank you for your question. Five pieces in my collection that I'm really, really proud of and I hold dear to my heart. Question 19 comes from Darcy, Mr. Six Strings Nine Lives himself. And he says, if you could spend a day with an artist, alive or dead, who would it be and why? I didn't even have to think about this. Um, it's Jimi Hendrix. Purely for the reason of... Um, he's one of those guys, like I mentioned earlier, that my dad introduced me to. Um, and I just couldn't pass up the, uh, the chance, if I could, to meet him. Because it would have just been phenomenal. I mean, Jimmy was such an innovator, um, forward thinking, just a massive, massive talent. A little bit like Kurt Cobain, who was only around for a few years and, uh, and passed away uh, tragically young, you know. And Jimmy's just amazing. I mean, just uh, what he was doing on the guitar was just unheard of at the time. He was just totally doing things that people had never seen or heard before. And, uh, and such a humble guy as well. I mean, I've seen interviews with him where people would be paying him compliments. I mean, he'll almost look embarrassed, you know. Um, a very humble guy, a phenomenal musician. Um, for me, still the best guitar player that ever lived. Um, Eddie Van Halen's a close second, but Jimi Hendrix is definitely first. I uh, didn't even have to think about this answer. It was always going to be Jimi Hendrix. If I could have meet, met him, it would have been phenomenal. Just to spend a day with him, watch him play with your own eyes. You know, it's great watching it on TV, anyway, but actually see it with your own eyes would have been absolutely phenomenal. Unfortunately, of course, it's never going to happen. I mean, he's not even been alive in my lifetime. But that's my answer to Darcy's question. You know, um, if I could spend the day with anyone, alive or dead, who would it be? And it's definitely Jimi Hendrix. Uh, just such a massive, massive guitar player. A massive hero to many. And just an absolute diamond bloke in general, basically. So that's my answer to that question. And the last question comes from my friend and bandmate, Mr. Paul Beerman. And he simply asks, Boulder, why are you such a cunt? All I can say to that, Paul, is it takes one to know one, mate. Right, guys, that's it for today. So thank you to everyone who sent questions in. It was very much appreciated. I've really enjoyed doing this video. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments section. And if uh, a lot of people have enjoyed it, then I'll uh, probably do another one of these again at some point in the future. As always, please like, comment, subscribe, get in touch. Um, if you're about on um, Friday night, I'm doing a, a live with Metal Mickey, uh, doing, the whole, doing the whole comfort zone thing where we listen to albums that neither of us are familiar with and talking about them. So that'll be a live stream at 9 o'clock on Friday night here in the UK. So please join us for that. Um, I'll be back next week with a collection update. I might actually be back midweek with... Um, 10 uh, death metal albums for, um, to show to aliens that uh, a thread of metal Mickey started not long ago. So, uh, yeah, I probably will see you before next weekend and before the live stream. Uh, once again, thanks to everyone who sent in the question. Cheers for watching, as always. And until next time, cheers, take care, and I'll see you later. Bye.